This is Zeiss Presents Full Exposure, the weekly resource for news, trends, and the people who influence the world of photography and cinematography. Hosted by veteran photographer and filmmaker Jim Camp. On our very first show, we welcome documentary photographer Stephen Chames. For over 50 years, Steve has been one of the leading photojournalists covering social issues. Steve began his career as a student at UC Berkeley in 1969, covering the Black Panther Party from behind the scenes. He later took on another long-term photo project, Traversing America, to document child poverty. His work has been published in 10 monographs and is in the permanent collections of many of the nation's top museums. Our chat with Steve is in two parts. Steve, thanks for joining us on our inaugural show. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here. All the way out. Thank you. Um, I, but the first thing I'd like to know, which I, you know, I, I've, I've done some research on you, but the one thing I really couldn't find too much about, unless I wasn't checking the right sources, was, you know, I know you went to Berkeley, and that's, you know, how you got, where you got kind of started. But what's your earlier? You're from, you're from where, uh, outside, Ma- outside Boston. Originally? No, I, w- I was born in Cambridge right. and then was a little kid in, in Chicago, suburbs of Chicago. Or to, or and then at, at the age of 12, we moved to, our family moved to California. So I consider myself a Californian. And I, California. We were in Santa Monica and uh, West L.A. And um, I used to, have, you know, all summer, uh, I'd be on the beach all day. <laughs> You know, barefoot. I, I mean, it was great. Were you a surfer? Was, um, <laughs> not on a surfboard, but I knew, you, you know, a lot of the kids. I mean, yeah, in California, school would let out and everyone would go to the beach. Yeah. And the surfers would go to the beach. But we Didn't body matter, surfed. Oh, God. I mean, big, the big, big waves. Yeah. And it was great. So when you went to, when you graduated, and you went to uh, graduate high school and you went to Berkeley, what, what is it you wanted to do? I wasn't sure. I... I I, I probably, if I hadn't started taking pictures and gotten involved in the movement, met the Black Panthers, and, and you know, all that stuff wasn't going on at Berkeley, I probably uh, would have been a professor. Um, was that, I, was I, I was thinking of being a professor. I was interested in psychology. I thought maybe I'd try and be, um, you know, a psychologist uh, or a psychiatrist or something like that. My, my dad was a lawyer. So that was always lurking. And my grandfather was a lawyer, too. So that was always lurking in Mm. the background. But um, I picked up a a camera and started, you know, things were going crazy. In college, you picked up a camera. Yes. In college, I picked up a camera. Well, to go back in high school, I actually went to Putney in Vermont. was a boarding school. I got a scholarship. And it was kind of a crazy. Like a prep prep school? It was a prep school, but it was kind of a crazy uh, artistic prep school. I mean, Sally Mann went there. Alex Webb went there. No kidding. Um, <laughs> um, Pete Seeger's um, nephews um, went there. Alan Sean, who's the 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 uh, um, and Wally Sean, who the actor, whose father was the editor of the New Yorker, and Jay Hamburger, mm-hmm. who's Father Philip Hamburger and Mother Edith Iglauer were writers for the New Yorker, so you get the idea. Mm-hmm. Who was there? And Walter Ruther's wow. daughter was there. So, so it was a very creative. It was uh, a very uh, kind of creative yeah. in, uh, environment, and and I didn't do photography there. But one of the the teachers I was really close to was the the photo guy. He was a science teacher, and we were really close. At any rate, when I when I went to Berkeley, um, nineteen sixty. Six, I guess, or sixty-seven, I hitchhiked to to New York and hung out in the East Village, um, which was you know crash pads and all that stuff, and and um, I bought a camera and started taking pictures. And then when I went back to um, to Berkeley, just things were popping. I mean, that the, there were um, um, you know demonstrations against the war. And then later there was the first, uh, I think starting in, in 68, there was the first uh, um, demonstrations for a black studies department. The Black Panthers were there. I mean, Tom Hayden was there. Jerry Rubin was hanging around. You know, everyone was, was coming in and out of Berkeley. Yeah. And there, there were a lot of uh, demonstrations and the police were beating people up. So I first started um, taking pictures of that. 
uh, Max Scheer, who was editor of the Berkeley Barb, which was the most famous underground uh, newspaper, alternative newspaper, saw me one day when I, I had a camera said, hey, kid, you like to work for the Barb? And because the police were arresting people, it was a curfew, and they were arresting people on Telegraph Avenue. And I had been sitting in one of the coffee shops drinking coffee, you know. And so I took some pictures and I started becoming a photographer for the Barb. One of the other photographers, Alan Copeland, who became my best buddy, um, took me. He was photographing for the Associated Press and Newsweek. He was a better photographer at that time, that, you know, more advanced than me. I was just still just a student out. and yeah. starting out. He took me over to the AP and I met Sal Vader. Um, and a number who was a Pulitzer Prize winner and a, a number of other photographers. And so between them and um, there was a uh, art studio at, at, at Berkeley um, where Leonard Sussman and Dave Bond, um, Dave Bond did pictures for the uh, Sierra Club um, books and, and uh, Leonard Sussman, who now lives in, in Brooklyn, not hmm. that far from me, is a professor hmm. at Brook College. They, they taught me photography, but I also hmm. learned from the photographers at the AP. So I kind of had the art, but also the down and out, you know, jur journalism. Did training. you start s stringing pretty, pretty uh, oh, quickly absolutely, for AP? Because ev things were happening every day on the campus in there. And so um, I was actually making money. I mean, that's how I was paying for college and my, my rent and stuff. I mean, I, at, at one point I was making, I think, uh, 80 or $100 a week, which back then is the, uh, kind of the equivalent of making like four or $500 a week now, yeah. which for a college student, I mean, I was... College is a little cheaper then, too. Well, it was much cheaper. <laughs> Berkeley was almost free right. back then. Right. I, I mean, if you were a resident of California. Right. Right. Uh, um, so... Um, you know, but of course, photography is very expensive. So it wasn't like I was saving a lot of money. I was buying cameras and lenses and setting up dark rooms and all this sort of stuff. So did that, something kind of click at that point? This, forgive the uh, yeah. pun. Yeah. Uh, that, um, you know, you kind of saw that this is something I really want to. Yeah. I, I always, I guess in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be an artist. My mom collected art. My mom was a poet and later became a professor. Um, and my mom, when she was in college, my, my dad, um, when he came back from the war on the GI Bill, got into Harvard Law School, and my mom was at Radcliffe, and she was actually the editor of the Radcliffe paper. And when she graduated, the New York Times offered her a job um, to be their China correspondent. But it was, you know, 1948, and my dad didn't want her to work. He wanted her oh, to be a mom, so oh. she didn't take the job. Oh, wow. And she had me in 1947, mm -hmm. um, which made it uh, you know, impossible for her right. to, to go. And then, of course, Mao closed off China. But right. she still had the job at the, could have had a job at the New York Times, so she was very talented. Mm. So she was a poet, and she collected art, and we always had original art in the house. Mm. And she, knew, she actually knew the artist. She'd collect the art from the artist, and she got to know... She was kind of a crazy bohemian um, 50s, you know, mm -hmm. artist type person. And so I, I lost my train of thought, but basically I always wanted to be an artist and I was, uh, you know, so. It was percolating. Was yeah, there. but I couldn't draw, I couldn't paint. I knew I wasn't, you know, it, it, you know, so photography it was sort of serendipitous. Yeah, but it worked because I felt I found that I could express myself with the camera, and I, I found out by accident just doing these pictures of police beating people up and 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 the demonstrations. But I found that, and other people told me I had talent. You know, the AP and people mentored me, and you know they, you know what I mean. They yeah. helped helped me along, um, and then. In 1967, I, my dad came up from Los Angeles and we marched together Closer. in the first um, peace march, in San first San Francisco peace march against the war in Vietnam was mm. April 15th, 1967. And I'm walking along with my dad with my little camera and out of the corner of my eye, I see these two very charismatic black men which was Huey and Bobby, Huey hmm. Newton and Bobby Seale, selling red books. Huh. And I took one frame, and someone stepped in front of Huey 
so the picture which is in the book and it's on um in in the Panther book, I don't do know have, if it's do we on my it website. Okay. If you don't, I'll send it to okay, you. Okay, sure. Um, it's a Bobby selling the red books. That's Bobby Seal, yeah. and and um, neither Bobby or I remember how it actually occurred. But I started hanging out with the Panthers, so I was still a student. It was 1967, 1968. Um, I started hanging out with, with the Panthers and with Bobby, and Bobby liked me, and the Panthers started using my photographs in their newspaper. And the relationship just grew and grew and grew, and of course, um, Bobby was kind of like a father figure to me. He's kind of a mentor, and of course, he was the chairman. So he just brought me in and I started taking more and more more pictures and I, I stayed with Bobby and the Panthers through, through his run as mayor of Oakland um, in 1973. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so that was really the first big project that- Long-term project. Long-term yeah. uh, project that I did. And, and today, I mean, probably- and it just kind of like happened, right? I mean, you didn't plan it I was it just or doing it, yeah. 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 I mean, I was living it, I was doing it. I was going to the, the rallies, I was, I mean, basically I, I, I'm trying to get a book on the 60s out now, we can talk about that later, mm -hmm. but I photographed everything. I photographed Cesar Chavez, I photographed Angela Davis, I photographed the Panthers, uh, the Vietnam, marches and demonstrations and then San Francisco State and Berkeley um, the the strikes the student strikes to establish black studies departments uh, the Indians of all tribes took over Alcatraz Island I mean everything that was going on I was there and I, I was a participant photographer um, when I graduated in 69, I made the transition to become a professional photographer, but I had been stringing for the AP already for two years, even while, while I was a student. And also eventually with the Panthers, I mean, I started out photographing the rallies, and then I photographed the breakfast program, but then I was pretty much the only one who wasn't a Panther, and they, you know, they, who was allowed behind the scenes. I mean, I was in the office, I was in people's homes, I was, uh, you know, I got intimate pictures. And that's, you know, so my archive is the most complete archive of Panther pictures in the world. I mean, nobody, the AP, nobody has an archive that's as extensive as, as, as mine. And it's weird when I look back because I really didn't know what I was doing. I was a student. I mean, I was still learning. Um, but you yeah. know, I mean, you you also you know, uh, I mean, are you? I mean, I guess you're more or less self-taught, right? So when you're so, when you don't go to school for it, or a lot yeah. of us to a degree be, are, are self-taught, you learn by doing. Well, exactly. I just learned by doing it, trying out different things, uh, seeing what what happened, and of course, I I did have people at the AP who would critique my pictures, and as I said, there was that art, there was Leonard and Dave Bond, who at the art studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was not just photography. They had sculptors in there and painters, but they had, they had a dark room. Does anyone listening know what a dark room is? Does anyone- Other than a room you walk into and turn uh, off the lights. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I mean, th this was, uh, you know, weird to me. A number of years ago, I think it was at least 10 years ago, I was at a Thanksgiving dinner and there was a Time Magazine photographer there who had just come back from uh, Iraq. So it was probably longer than 10 years ago. But at any rate, um, I asked him, um, you know, before he, he turned digital, what was his favorite film? And he looked at me and he said, film? <laughs> And so um, <laughs> things have <laughs> things have progressed, but um, you know. So I did have people mentoring me and and critiquing my work. But very early, I was working for the New York Times as a stringer, the Washington Post as a stringer, the Associated Press, Newsweek. Um, but, you know, all they were all using my my pictures off and on, um, and I a very early I think possibly while I was still a student, the New York Times hooked, hooked me up with Earl Caldwell, 
mm-hmm. who was a, a, a reporter, their West yeah. Coast reporter. And so I went all up and down the, the West Coast with, with Earl. I was one of their stringers. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you, well, as a, the, the thing about being a stringer, though, is that um, you don't always have the benefit of having editing advice. So if you're sending your film in those days, you know, you send it and you don't know how it's being edited. So, you know, uh, I, I mean, we can talk about that, too. But, you know, I think that's one of the toughest thing as a, any photographer is editing your own work. And right. it, there's there's a real advantage to having, you know, uh, we talked about some earlier. We were talking about, you know, uh, people that mentor and you know they're one of the things how they mentor <laughs> is they're really good editors you know and they exactly. and they can make decisions that you're you're too close to what you're doing so you know they have to sometimes be brutal and you know and right well uh, alan was a really good editor and we we formed a photo agency photon west and uh so alan actually taught me a lot and we had a kind of a collective dark room hmm. And so we'd do the film and we'd look at it. And of course, when it'd go into the AP, they weren't editing for art, but they would, you know, they'd clip, they punch had the, the little the, clip and they'd punch, punch the negatives. They'd yeah. punch the, the, the negatives right. and, yeah. and uh, you'd get instant, instant feedback. And also being out there, I mean, the thing is there were demonstrations. I, I In 60, for two years, the campus was almost closed down every day. There were police on the campus and, then in 69, uh, People's Park, the, the Governor Reagan, whatever happened to him. Um, the name sent, sounds familiar. Yeah. He sent the uh, National Guard onto our campus with bayonets. So we had the National Guard on campus. The police were, were on campus almost every day, you know, beating people up because people were demonstrating mm. and arresting people. And so we were, you know, so you learn fast, I mean, where to stand to get a good picture, because if you made the wrong choice, you got hit over the head. So (laughs) very, uh, (laughs) (laughs) you learn fast (laughs) how to do it. (laughs) Our version of being a a domestic war photographer, you know, it it was, uh, no, it was crazy times. And of course the AP people, um, you know, we were very close to them because basically, um, they would intercede with us to keep the the police away from us, and we would intercede with the demonstrators to make sure that the no, he's not a police spy. Mm-hmm. You know, he's mm-hmm. with really with the AP, mm-hmm. and people knew us. Everyone knew us, and if I would say someone wasn't a police spy, they would fine, let them take pictures. You know, because people get paranoid in those situations. Yeah, I'm just wondering if it did that. <clears throat> Did your association with, you know, being a stringer for newspapers and AP, did that have any effect on your relationship with the Panthers? No, not at all. Okay. No. In fact, when Newsweek did the Panther cover, they had me do the cover. So they were, they were, they were pretty media savvy. Uh, oh, the Panthers were incredibly media savvy. I mean, they really understood, I mean, everything from... Um, you know, and if you read the book, people should, I mean, I did a book with Bobby Seale, which came out in 2016 called Power to the People, The World of the Black Panthers, which Abrams published. Mm-hmm. And it's really also an oral history. It's not just a photo book, it's an oral history. I interviewed at least 20 of the living Panthers and, and um, I went out and spent a week with Bobby Seale and we actually, I hired a, a sound guy who worked for, um, you know, NPR and other stations in San Francisco. And he did a professional recording of Bobby Seal, you know, broadcast quality. And we had it transcribed. Then we edited that down for Bobby's text in the book because he's the co-author uh, of the book. But then I went and interviewed Kathleen Cleaver and Big Man and Emery Douglas and just a bunch of other Panthers who were, you know, s- um, still around. Um, and... Bobby talks in the book, first of all, they made the 10 points. I mean, they, they had a program. They were a political party. The Panthers weren't just weren't a protest group. They were actually a political party. And as early as 1968, they ran candidates for office and they registered tens of thousands of people to vote. That was always their thing, to get people registered to vote. So they were a revolutionary party, but they also were working 
within the electoral system. They, the Bobby and Huey re- recognized that they weren't going to overthrow the government of the United States, and they didn't want to do that anyway. They wanted to get... They wanted political power. They political wanted power. political power. Yeah. And in America, you do that through the ballot box. So, And Bobby said in the book that in 1968, on all levels, out of half a million elected officials from school board, local school boards, to the president of the United States, there were only 50 African Americans Mm -hmm. elected officials, according to Bobby Seale in 1968. Now there there are many more. There was also a draft. There was also (laughs) a draft. At any rate, the Panthers and also, I mean, everything that they they did, they really understood the media. I mean, just even how they dressed, the beret, the black leather jackets, the blue shirt, the, the, you know, they just look sharp. Um, They. There's Bobby. Yeah. And that's actually this picture is Bobby at, at a press conference. So again, um, you know, they knew how, yeah. I mean, in some ways that worked for them and in some ways it worked uh, against them. When Bobby Seale marched on Sacramento with, with uh, the guns to protest uh, um, the Panther, in California at the time it was legal to openly carry guns as long as, they, as, long as there wasn't a bullet in the, in the chamber. You'd carry a shotgun or a handgun. Mm. Legally, California is a Western state, yeah. and of course, many people in the United yeah. States, uh, you know, we have that whole gun control thing, and and you know, we can't outlaw guns here. It seems to be impossible. But when the Panthers started carrying legal guns when they were patrolling the police, they had a law book in one hand, and the gun in the other hand, and they would patrol the police, and they would, if the police were doing something that was not legal. Huey or Bobby would say, you know, according to this, um, uh, Huey was a law student, so he knew the law. He would say, according to penal code so-and-so and so-and-so, mm-hmm. you know, b- number 0.5, um, it, y- you can't do that, officer. And, of course, um, they had the guns <laughs> also uh, because groups that had tried that in other cities in Los Angeles, when they said that to the police, the police would just beat them up. So... Um, that didn't happen because the Panthers were, you know, they, they, right. were, they were there. Right. Um, and, of course, that was a recruiting thing. And so then, uh, th- then Reagan, um, they, 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 they put a there. law that uh, making it illegal. One of the strictest gun. this is the, the icon of conservatism, signed a bill, one of the strictest gun control laws at the time and probably even today, making it illegal to have a gun within a hundred feet of a public highway, <laughs> which meant nothing in any cities, just in rural areas right. you could have you could have guns. Right. I mean, can you imagine if some Democrat proposed that today, what they would be calling him, you know, a, a, a <laughs> communist. Yeah. You know, so so the Panthers marched up to, to Sacramento carrying, carrying guns, and of course that got on the front page of every newspaper. In a sense, that kind of backfired. I mean, it, it got them a lot of publicity, but it also made an image which the government was able to exploit. Sure. Um, and when, when Nixon decided to, to crack down and assassinate Panthers and send the police, you know, COINTELPRO and send the police in, um, that was the media image that that the a lot of the the mainstream media kept um, presenting. Whereas at that time, um, the Panthers had stopped carrying guns. Um, by 1969, they had stopped carrying guns, and they were running programs. and And eventually, they had more mm. than 60 community programs. The most mm. famous of which was the Breakfast for School Children program, which they started before the United States before Lyndon Johnson started feeding school kids in school. Well, breakfast. also, that was like 68. That's when Nixon was elected, right? And that was uh, yeah, elected so on the, a law and order, so-called law and order platform. So that all, but that, all sort the, of coincided. But the breakfast programs actually started um, when Lyndon Johnson was prior president. To that, yeah, yeah. It started prior to that and actually was one of the reasons that the government 
started the Breakfast for School Children program is to, because that was very, very popular. I mean, when Gallup did a poll um, in the black community, the Panthers had a 90% favorable rating. Mm. Uh, it was probably the opposite in the white community <laughs> um, as people feel threatened, right. you know, um, and that exists till today. So uh, ju- just how did the, how did your, um, your association with the being so uh, close with the Panthers and being with them so long, how did that sort of th- that sort of like peter out with uh, in you said in the what was it in the seven seventy three seventy three? Um, well, the after Bobby ran for mayor, the Panthers kind of it, that was kind of the end, the last hurrah, um, for a lot of reasons. One of which was that the government just put a lot of them in jail and assassinated a bunch of um, Panthers and and really COINTELPRO was very effective. I mean, the United States government is very powerful and can be very effective and we don't need to go into it here, but anyone's interested, it's been documented. Senator Edward Kennedy and Senator Frank Church actually held hearings. It was the Frank Church, the church committee, subcommittee. They held hearings on COINTELPRO and basically issued a document which condemned the FBI that Mm. that basically said the FBI had police departments assassinate Mm. people, such as Fred Hampton, for instance, who was shot 50 times or so when he was was drugged. Um, The the FBI had a, a guy who, you know, uh, undercover agent in the Panthers, and he drugged him. So he was like out cold, wow. and they burst in and just shot him 50 times wow. as he was sleeping. Yeah. I mean, they didn't burst in and arrest him. They burst in and assassinated him, and that that became a... And there were a number of those, and, and uh, they finally were exposed by this, this Senate committee, which mm. said, you know, no one, no, no one in the FBI went to jail over it but yeah. it, but at, at any rate um, that was kind of really a, a low point in the Nixon administration to actually assassinate people on US soil mm. so the so uh, as the as your uh, you know such you did such a long term project i mean that you had probably no idea when you first started that it was going to go as long as it did what did that that did that sort of launch you into knowing that that's what you wanted to do was long term social focused yeah projects? pretty pretty much i mean it was that and I, I mean also at the time i was shooting a lot of news because every day there were demonstrations there were different things going on and and then um between the new york times and and newsweek especially in the washington post they would also give me assignments you know, they. In other words, a writer would be doing an article, and they yeah. would they would send me along with the writer um, to shoot pictures. So it was the combination of, of of the two. And when I graduated, I mean, I was basically making a living while I was a student and and paying my rent and paying my bills um, with the money I was earning working for, um, you know, these different publications. And back then, you could actually make a living. As a photojournalist working for publications, <laughs> um, exactly. I mean, you, people would actually pay for pictures. Now everyone wants everything for free because people just there's so many. Everyone has a camera and they're shooting and they give it away for nothing. Right. Um, you know, but back then they would actually pay you. You know, pay you to for your pictures go on assignment. So when I graduated, I just continued uh, being a professional photographer at some point in there I turned professional and just kept doing but what you did was sort of like what a lot of us did as photojournalists you know working for you know stringing for the times and you know doing all that stuff that a lot of us did you did kind of a, a very rarefied thing that a lot of us wanted to do but it wasn't always that available I mean it's more available when there were magazines and there were more uh you know publications here that's a lot you know has gone away but you know um you know there's still that appreciation for it i think in europe especially france which you know you've probably seen but you know how did you go from just being a a news photographer i just want to say just a news photographer because (laughs) i was too but you know to doing these you know like you did the panthers project what was your next one that you just sort of felt like i'm going to sink my teeth into this i mean the next a big one was actually years later. I did a number of smaller 
things. I, I did a thing on, on teenagers, kind of a adolescent project, uh, which didn't really get published. I mean, by the way, most of my Panther pictures weren't published. We, in 1970, we, were, we tried to do a book and actually I got a book contract and, and Spiro Agnew was vice president and the Nixon administration stopped the book. And it was 40 really? years before it came out. Yeah, they told... Um, they Spiro, told that there was a publisher and they... No, no, I had a it. letter of intent from, from the publisher and I drove across the country and photographed Panthers in about 10 different cities. And when I got to New York, um, I found out that Spiro Agnew had used to golf with the CEO of this publishing company. <laughs> and he said to the to the, wow. the CEO, we yeah. don't want this book to come out. Huh. And they fired the editor and they refused to honor the letter. I mean, basically, they couldn't say we wouldn't publish the book. So what they started doing is just making ridiculous demands. Yeah. And you had no recourse, so. No, well, yeah. what could we do? Yeah. We, yeah. we actually tried to go to other publishers. We could have taken them to court and 10 years later we <laughs> would have gotten some right. money, but we decided to try and find other publishers and basically no one would publish it. The word got out. I mean, people were scared of Nixon. Yeah. They, this was 1970 we were doing this book and people were scared of Nixon. They knew that if they published the book, the IRS would uh, <laughs> audit them and um, yeah. uh, you know that they would be spied upon and uh, you know whatever that, that was um, So was, what was your next project? I mean that, well, that next, sort of had to be shelved um, and, and you know you, next but bit, well, you, you, you kind of felt at that point that I could. Like yeah, I, said, I mean, the next big, big thing that I did was Outside the Dream, Child Poverty in America. And how did that come to you? Okay, I, well, <clears throat> one of my roommates at Berkeley had, was Marty Reuscher, and he was on the steering committee of the free speech movement and was one of the ways I got involved in politics in, in Berkeley is Marty, you know, introduced me to Mario Savio and, you know, all the, all, yeah. all the people. And... I actually started out, uh, you know, I got elected to the student government when I was a, a, a freshman and, and I'd go to meetings. I was a monitor, a dry, you know, and, but I hated it. I hated the kind of p politics that, you know, all the mm -hmm. nonsense that went on in politics and kind of decided I was going to be a, the artist of the movement and not try and mm -hmm. be a politician type, you know, mm -hmm. or a, a student leader or anything. So, Marty um, introduced me to Marion Wright Edelman, oh. uh, who was chairman of, uh, president of the Children's, Children's Defense, Defense Fund. Fund. Yeah. And um, so we had a meeting, and she told me about child poverty, hmm. uh, that it was that in 19, um, I think the meeting was in 1983 or 84 at some point, and, and that the one, uh, you know, 20% of a one out of five American children was now living in poverty. And it, you know, there would, had been a big spike in, um, in child poverty and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so I start, I researched it, started researching it. And I started out just doing some, I was a stringer at that time. I was stringing for, um, the, the Los Angeles times. And so I did, um, you know, went with a reporter and we did a couple of things. We went to Orange County and we went to uh, South Carolina and went to uh, um, a couple, of pe I think Peoria, we went to a couple of places. For a paper, for the for a story for the paper? Or was it, was it a, for the magazine, for the Times Magazine? No, or? actually it wasn't, no. Actually that happened after, it. Uh, take that back. I, I started in 84, I started doing, doing um, some pictures. And one of the first things I did is I did a piece for Chicago Magazine um, on poverty in, in Chicago and the housing projects and all this stuff. Um, then I, I applied for an Alicia Patterson Foundation grant. Was that your first, that was your first one? The, did you get two Patterson grants or just no, that just one? No, just that, that one. one. Okay. I only applied once yeah. uh, and I got it. And they gave it to me. And so I, the year 1985, I took the whole year off. And I, I researched it, and I started in California photographing homeless, like this picture of this boy sleeping in a car, um, which is out in the beach in Ventura, California. Hmm. 
And I started in Los Angeles, which had the 50,000 homeless people and more homeless people than anyone else in the United States. And I basically drove across the, the, the country and stopped at different places. I stopped in Iowa for the farm crisis. The people were losing their farms there. I went to um, uh, Chicago. Um, I think um, I, I had done, I think I, in 84 I did something, I may have done something for Stern Magazine on poverty. But anyway, and then I did, a, you know, on the side, I did a, a piece for the LA Times. But basically, I was on this grant. And I spent the whole year, as my friend joked, I, I just came home to change my underwear. You mm -hmm. know, I was mm -hmm. just like gone the whole year. And I, I was living with the families a, a lot of the time. I mean, I actually would meet people and say, can I actually sleep on your sofa? Mm -hmm. Can I become part of your life? I mm -hmm. actually embedded myself mm -hmm. uh, with people, which is really the only way you can really do a project like that um, well. Um, and well, but and, and as you would probably say to any young photographer coming up, if you want to get do something intimate, you have to get to know people. You don't just show up and start taking pictures. You have to get them to be comfortable with you and so forth. And that is a pretty extreme example, living with your subjects. Yeah, well, but when you're photographing, you know, w what's the effects of poverty? You have to, because when you go in and out of situations, there's, first of all, life doesn't happen nine to five, and especially the, mm -hmm. the traumas. You know, like I remember I was in Michigan City, Indiana, staying with this uh, family of a, a steel worker who had gotten laid off and was like losing his home and just, mm -hmm. You know, that was kind of the beginning of the deindustrialization of large parts of the Rust Belt, what we now call the Rust Belt. That was kind of the beginning of it in 85. You know, it was going on, but um, it continued. Mm. I mean, it didn't just start that year, but I mean, that was, you know, that uh, anyway, I was with that family. And I remember at one point at 2 a.m., this guy just freaked out and, and his wife, you know, and I and the kids, we just, we took him to a mental health center. I mean, he just flipped out. He just, it got to be too much for him. Well, if you're just kind of coming in the day, you miss that stuff. Right. And, and you also don't really get an understanding of how people are living. Because if you just come like, you know, show up at 10 o'clock and stay for a couple hours. People are on good behavior. It's like you're... Yeah. You you're, may catch something, but you may not. Well, it's like you're... You're a guest, but when you're if, if you're actually staying there, you kind of become part of it, and after a while, people just lead their lives, and you're you become not, more more invisible. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like you're you're invisible. They know you're there, but it's like they don't care anymore. It's like, um, you know, I mean, what I've found is that if people feel that you're honestly portraying their life, that you're not looking down at them, you're not making fun of them but you're portraying them honest, even if they're taking drugs, you're doing a story and someone's taking drugs or doing something that isn't the greatest thing, they can accept it. They know who they are. They know what they're doing. They know what their, their life is. And if they feel you're portraying it honestly, I've found that most people are open to it. What people don't like is, is someone, you know, coming in and kind of looking down on them and, or making fun of well, them, and or that's that's a very sensitive topic, you know. I mean, because you're you're you know you're impinging on people potentially on their dignity, and their and people are proud, and they don't, you know, it's hard to get close in a situation like that. I would think. Yeah. And most photographers, especially those who do long term projects, I they don't do that. I I mean, unfortunately, and this is something that's happening more and more nowadays as budgets are getting tighter and people. Um, you know, you watch the news and half, the, aside from the BBC, you know, most of the news, CNN and, and, you know, which is actually a news outlet and CNBC, which is a news outlet, Fox News is a propaganda outlet. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, but even CNN, it's like a talk show. I mean, they'll have a segment on, then they have people debating it. It's opinion. They're, There's a lot of opinion on it. Well, it's opinion. Yeah. It, exactly. And, and, and 
I know that's because of, of budgets. Even if you look at the few magazines that's around, they're doing portraits. They're not doing long-term um, stories so much anymore. Where right. long-term stories have gone to, and I, we can touch on this later, is to art museums, um, to books, and on the internet. People put up websites. Well, um, yeah, and, and you've probably done <coughs> some of this too, but I know I did a lot of uh, portraiture that was, you know, for a story, and you're basically an illustrator. You know, right. You're, 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 you know, you're capturing somebody, you're doing the best you can to capture them, but you're not, you know, there's no, back, you know, in the 80s or whatever, in the 90s, there was still le less and less budget for doing long-term stories, you know. So that's why I said, you know, you're, <laughs> you know, you're, a lot of people that are, you know, that are, looking to be photographers, you know, look up to people like you that were able to do that, you know, were to able to pick a story as meaningful as child poverty and to actually get it done. This is the end of part one of our chat with Stephen Shames. Part two airs next week. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next week for another edition of Zeiss Presents Full Exposure. If you can't watch, you can always catch the audio-only version on iTunes and Spotify. Follow us on Instagram at Zeiss underscore Full Exposure or on the web at ZeissFullExposure.com. And to learn about the latest in Zeiss lenses, head to Zeiss.com. <laughs>